so we can uh, we can do this in a variety of ways. We can get someone to read, and then when there's something blocks the understanding, we can stop and take a look at it. Or someone can pull out a section and say, here's a good one. What page? Understanding being prodigious, you sure I will be reading a lot. Oh, <laughs> flattery. So, should I just start? Jump in? I think David said, uh, and a little after, is that the section? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a little after, he adds, <clears throat> you may say, therefore, that the good not only affords to objects of knowledge the power of being known, but likewise distributes their being and essence, while in the meantime the good itself is not essence, but above essence, excelling it both in dignity and power. <clears throat> it is plain, therefore, from the words of Plato himself that he considered the supreme principle of things superior to being, and consequently, this doctrine was not devised by the latter, later Platonists, contrary to the opinion of their divine master. But this is likewise evident from the testimony of Spusippus, the immediate successor of Plato, who, as we are informed by Proclus, confirmed this doctrine from the most ancient authority and asserted, quote, that the ancients considered the one as better than being, and that the principle of being was free from all proportion to the subsequent order of things, as the good itself is separated from every condition of any particular good. To this most respectable, to this most respectable evidence, we may also add that of the philosopher Moderatus, who, as we are informed by Simplicius, declares, quote, that according to the Pythagoreans from whom Plato, it must be observed, received the greater part of his philosophy, the first one is above all essence." Unquote. This sublime theory was supported by Plotinus with all that truly philosophic accuracy and depth for which his writings are everywhere so remarkable. Indeed, it appears to have been his favorite topic, for he has employed considerable parts of many of his books in its illustration and defense. Nor can we wonder at his partiality for this exalted speculation, if we consider that a union with this ineffable nature was the great aim of all his desires, and the only end of all his studies and pursuits. This was the divinely solitary light to which his intellectual eye was ever directed, and which so abundantly illumined the most secret recesses of his soul. Here he discovered the true fountain of good, and drank deep of its perennial streams. And lastly, here he derived those inestimable stores of knowledge 
which he so fortunately transmitted to future generations. That the English reader, therefore, may have a specimen of his inimitable writings on this abstruse subject and may see some of the deepest, the deepest mysteries of the Greek theology disclosed, I shall present him with a paraphrased translation of two books of Plotinus, the first of which is inscribed that intelligibles are not external to intellect and concerning the good, and the other concerning intelligible beauty. I have particularly chosen the I have particularly chosen these not only because they admirably unfold the depths of the Platonic philosophy and theology, but because the first relates to the vision of the Supreme, explaining the wonderful manner in which it is accomplished, and the second describes the method of becoming united with the intelligible world. The Platonic reader will find in these books, if I have done justice to their divine author, instances of sublimity beyond all comparison with any other writings, and specimens of a profundity of thought unequaled by any other philosopher. I am sensible that the great labor I have employed in the translation will be most probably lost on the present generation, but though I write with no views nor desires of popular renown, yet I flatter myself with the approbation of more equitable posterity. The fifth book, therefore, the fifth Aeneid of Plotinus, is as follows. Is it possible anyone can think that true intellect, possessing true being, can at any time be deceived and believe in things which have no real existence? Certainly no one. For how could it be intellect if it, were, if it is ever liable to deception? It is requisite, therefore, that it should always understand, and that nothing should ever be concealed from it, like those natures that are subject to oblivion. But it is likewise necessary that knowledge should reside in its essence, not like one imagining, or doubting, or deriving inform information from another. Nor yet again, like knowledge collected from demonstration. For though it is granted that some things are collected by demonstration, it cannot likewise be denied that something is of itself known to intellect, at the same time that reason dictates that all knowledge is essential to its nature. But it is now necessary to inquire after what manner we must distinguish the essential knowledge of intellect and that which it obtains by investigation. Likewise, from whence the th certainty is derived to intellect of its essential knowledge from whence its faith is derived that it is in such a condition. Because about things offered to the senses, the belief of which appears more certain, it is usual to doubt whether they possess their apparent nature in the subject things, or in certain passions only, where certainly the judgment of intellect, or at least of thought, is required. For though it should, perhaps, be granted, that the natures of sensible, sensible objects are contained in their subject bodies, yet what is known by sense is nothing more than an image of the object, for sense cannot apprehend the thing itself, since it abides external to its perception. But intellect, when it understands and apprehends intelligibles, if it knows these as something different from itself, after what manner is it connected with them? For it may happen that it shall not meet with them, and consequently that it may not understand. Or perhaps then at last, when it meets with them, it will immediately understand, and thus it will not always possess intellection. And if it should be said that intelligibles are conjoined with intellect, it remains to inquire what's, what such a conjunction means. Besides, the intellections themselves will be certain figures, and if this is the case, they will be adventitious, and nothing more than certain pulsations. But after what manner will intellect be figured, and what will be the form of intelligibles? Lastly, from this hypothesis, intelligence will be like sense, a perception of externals. After what manner, then, do these disagree among themselves? Shall we say in this that one of them comprehends lesser concerns? 
also. How can intellect know that it perceives something in reality? Or how will it be able to judge that this is good, or beautiful, or just? For every one of these will be different from intellect, nor will it contain the principles of judging by which it believes. But these also will be external to its essence, and in the same manner, truth. Again, intelligibles themselves are either destitute of sense, life, and intellect, or they possess intellect. If they possess intellect, they will equally contain both. And this will be the true and first intellect. But of this also we inquire how it contains truth, intelligible itself and intellect. Whether subsisting in the same and together or in some other manner. But if intelligibles themselves are destitute of intellect and life, we must inquire what they are. For they are neither certain propositions, nor axioms, nor dictions. For if this were the case, they would affirm something of other things, but would not be things themselves. As if they should say that what is just is beautiful, when at the same time justice itself is different from the beautiful itself. But if they should consider as simple essences the just itself and the beautiful itself apart from each other, in the first place, intelligible itself will not be a certain one, but every intelligible will be separate from others, in which case we must inquire where they are and in what places they are separately disposed. Afterwards, in what manner intellect everywhere, running round in a discursive procession, is able to find these. Also, how it abides, and again, how it abides or perseveres in the same and what form or figure it is endued with. <clears throat> Unless, perhaps, intelligibles are situated like certain images formed from gold or from some other matter by a statuary or painter. But if this be the case, intellect in its perceptions will be the same as sense. Besides, in what respect among these is this intelligible? Justice. But that something else. Lastly, this is the most powerful objection of all, namely, if anyone should entirely admit that these are extrinsical and that intellect speculates them as having an external position, it necessarily follows that intellect does not possess the truth of these, but is deceived in the contemplation of each. For the object of its contemplation will be truly external, it will therefore behold them deprived of their intimate possession and containing only their images in a knowledge of this kind. Since therefore it does not possess truth itself but only contains certain images of truth, it will possess what is false and having nothing of truth. If then it knows that it contains only what is false, it must undoubtedly confess itself to be destitute of truth. But if it is ignorant of this, and thinks that it participates of truth, when at the same time it is destitute of its possession, it is deceived by a twofold fallacy, and is very far distant from truth. For it is on this account, as I think, that truth is not to be found in sensible objects, but opinion alone, because opinion is conversant in receiving, from whence its name is derived. On this account it receives something different from itself, since that also is different from which it possesses what it receives. If then truth is not resident in intellect, such an intellect cannot be truth, nor a true intellect, nor intellect at all, nor indeed will truth be resident in any other place. Hence it is not proper either to investigate intelligibles separate from intellect, or to confess that the figures of things only are contained in intellect, or to deprive it of truth while we admit it is ignorant of intelligibles, and that the objects of its intellection have no existence in the order of things. But it is necessary to attribute all things to true intellect, if it is requisite to induce knowledge and truth, to preserve beings themselves, and that knowledge and that knowledge by which the essence of everything is known, 
and no longer to acquiesce in the resemblances and images of things as when we alone understand the particular mode of existence and not the real essence of a thing, in this case neither possessing the object itself nor dwelling with it, nor conspiring into one with its nature. For intellect indeed truly knows, nor is anything concealed from its essential intelligence, nor is it liable to oblivion, nor does it wander by investigation, but it contains truth, and the seat of things in its essence, and is ever vital and intelligent. All which properties indeed ought to reside in the most blessed nature, or where can anything honorable and venerable be found? Hence it neither requires demonstration nor the faith of persuasion. That intellect is thus essentially intelligent, for it is entirely manifest to itself. And there is nothing more worthy of faith than its own essence, so that it contains real truth, not consonant to any other but to itself, nor does it pronounce and exist anything besides itself, and that which it is, it pronounces. Who then can confute it? And from whence can he bring his confutation? For the argument which is adduced must revolve into the same with the former. And although it is employed as different, it is nevertheless referred to the thing proposed by the first argumentator. And it is with it entirely one and the same. For nothing can be found more true than truth. This one nature intellect, therefore, is all beings. It is truth. It is a great deity. Or rather, it is not any particular God, but is deservedly every deity. And such is the nature of this second divinity, appearing to beholders before they survey that superior God, who is seated in sublimer majesty on the illustrious throne of intellect, depending from, it, from his ineffable nature, for it is highly proper that he should not subsist in an inanimate seat, nor again immediately occur to us moving in the circular chariot of soul, but that an inestimable beauty should wonderfully shine before his appearance, as before the presence of a mighty king. For to such as advance to his intuition, it is ordained that lesser things should first occur and afterwards, that such as are greater should gradually represent themselves to the view and that such as surround the king should be more royal, and the rest in a degree proportionate to their distance from his ineffable glory. But after all these, the mighty king himself suddenly shines forth to the view, while the rest venerate the king in a suppliant manner. Such, I mean, as, I, as do not depart from thence till they have proceeded to the last spectacle of all, like those who are satisfied with the splendor of the attendance on majesty. Another king, therefore, reigns in this intelligible world, and his attendants are different from his nature. But this supernal king does not rule over foreign subjects, but he possesses a just and natural government and a true kingdom, since he is himself the king of truth, and is naturally the lord of his offspring, the universe, and of the divine company of immortal gods. Hence he is the king of a king, and of kings, and is called by a juster name, the Father of the Gods, whom indeed Jupiter or Zeus in this respect imitates, since he does not ask, acquiesce in the contemplation of his father, but proceeds beyond this to his grandsire, as to an energy in the very subsistence or hypostasis of his essence. Okay. Would you not agree we can follow that principle, that if he doesn't stop... <coughs> He, therefore, he must understand it all, and then we can sit back and ask him any questions. <laughs> Does not follow? Absolutely. I so. Is that, shall we pass that rule? We did. We did. We, we induced it before he took his seat. Yeah. And therefore, we can direct any question we want to our colleague. Indeed. And since no one raised their hand, shall we assume everybody understood it all, and therefore we have no questions? That was easy. <laughs> truth is truth. Let me ask you this. Come on. Stay. <laughs> What's the issue? What's he dealing with? The object? 
and non-object, truth. Truth is within itself, whereas it, it does not lie within, within an external object. Did we say how many kings there are in the hierarchy? Part of king. You know, or what, like, uh, seems like he's setting forth a hierarchy. You raised that question at the last Friday night, and I think it's still a good question. You know, and as I read through it again, I, I still don't see the answer. The question was? Uh, well, uh, how many, like they talk about kings, right, and a throne, and... Um, you know, and then they say another king. Therefore, on the top of the following page, mm -hmm. it's like uh, it, it was a little difficult for me to discern uh, how that set of uh, images of ruling applied to the metaphysics that he was setting for. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, just just one thought. Can you go back to? Uh, Curious page 159. Is it possible anyone can think that true intellect, possessing true being, can at any time be deceived? Look, see. Here's the state, right? Here's being. One. Now he comes out, and someone comes over to him and says, Hi, Harry, how are you? <laughs> and he says, I don't doubt that you experience what you experienced, but how do you know you are not deceived? Is that the issue? Yeah. Right. I mean, here's the guy's had it. His friend comes up and says, hey, I got news for you. I don't doubt you experienced this. That's not the issue. But how do we know that you're not being deceived? Right? Is that a good question? And that's why we have our colleagues ready to help us with this. How does he answer that? I don't know. No, he's always modest. But is that the issue? Come on, is that the issue? Page after page? Mm -hmm. Is it a good question or not? Sure, it is. It's one I think we all have to deal with. Because most people regard us as nuts. That's so true. So, I've got another friend that comes to these Friday night meetings and we participate in this online discussion group and we come across to these people in such a fashion that uh, it seems that we give them a lot of problems and that this is exactly the kind of question that is that we're having to deal with with them. It's like, how do you know you're not <coughs> fooled by all this platonic philosophy you're into? I'll try. I'm and out light that you might that you might think you got from it. Right? Yeah. So therefore, we need a good answer. <coughs> Would you agree? He just read it. Yeah. And read it well, right? Oh, right. right. Good. good. Well, I don't think he's saying that it's a philosophy that we have to be fooled by. What we have to be fooled by is where we direct and settle our intelligence. Do we settle it on the intelligible, or do we settle it and turn it back on the intellect? and therein reside peacefully in the truth. Well, what's the relation between the intelligibles and intellect? He's, at, the, at the beginning, it sounded like the difference between discursive thought and true thought, making distinctions that are questionable and um, hypothetical because you're using your intellect to try and judge things outside of intellect, whereas to use intellect purely and turn it back upon itself um, is to get out of discursive thought and get into a more complete, pure kind of thought. Okay. Which would result in seeing, I would presume, that 
intelligibles are not external to intellect. Is that right? No, it's just that intellect trumps intelligibles in that it not only can see intelligibles, but it can see itself. Hmm. I mean, if, if you're going to get beyond discursive and um, uh, delusion, you know, you know, delusion. And, I mean, how close can you get to the one in the intellect without actually just like stepping right on it, you know, and getting stinky with it? This is, he's going with as close, you know, he's playing around purely in the world of the good. If you're looking at the allegory that he just stepped out of, mm -hmm. he's out of the sun, he's out of the light, and he's trying to figure how light and, um, the, and intellect and intelligibles and the good are working um, purely in mind. And he stepped out of the cave completely. He's trying to answer the question of intellect without using Or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, all right. <laughs> now the point is, can we come on? Can we use it? Come on. Would you agree we got a perfect subject? He said this is the yeah, very issue that he's dealing with on the web. <laughs> Sounded wonderful until that or not part at the end. <laughs> that was fun. But then again, riding around like the king of the world is stupid too. I think we should go on and read what he says about the good. Go ahead. I, you know, I don't know what to say. <laughs> because he got into, he I'm got satisfied. Back, he got back into the allegory, I think, at that point. And I think, I think in the next paragraph he says, but as about the, concerning the good itself. And of course, like I said, I don't read very well. Did you have a question, Stan? Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it seems like he says that intellect cannot demonstrate that it knows itself. It's out of the nature. Yeah, let's not waste time doing stuff. Let's just let it do what it does purely. Now, I don't know what that does for, you know, like, when you go shopping at 7-Eleven, but it's fun to talk about. No <laughs> <coughs> friend to go surfing with. Page 162, it looks to me like he uses direct experience as the way to validate it, that that's the only way. That may be, but how, do, how about this issue? Well, see, uh, he says that you know you're not deceived because, because the, it, it neither requires demonstration nor the faith of persuasion that intellect is thus essentially intelligent, for it is entirely manifest to itself and there's nothing more worthy of faith in its own essence, so that it contains real truth, not consonant to any other but to itself. Okay. So who can confute it? Uh, for the argument which is abduced must resolve into the same with the former. For nothing can be found more true than truth. No, that's right. The page. Page 162. Now look, see, this is why my copy is different than yours. <laughs> uh, good. See, he starts it off at page 159, and therefore you can skip 160 and 161 and just go to 162 for the answer. And that's what I always like. <laughs> but wait a minute, did that answer the question? See, he's going to focus on two words, and he's going to say, he's not going to disagree. You never want to disagree. <clears throat> That's an argument. You assume the other person is say, stating something that can be demonstrable, and you say, okay, what are the class of things? What is it to be deceived? What are the conditions? What are the conditions for being deceived? That's all. First. 
What kinds of things can you genuinely be deceived about? Second, right? Notice, how do you know you are not deceived? What kind of knowing is that? How do you know you're not being deceived? That's reflective, isn't it? How do you know you're not being deceived? Huh? How do you know you're not whistling Dixie? Because <laughs> I'm not in pain. <laughs> now look, come on, look, see. He's going to play with this word. He's going to say, look here, see. Let's, let's use this. All right? If you, if you can be deceived, <clears throat> right? If you can be deceived and know it, well, that's rather curious. That's, a, that's yeah. right pretty on. tough. Pardon me? That's pretty tough. Only Ion can get in that state of mind. No. 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 That's it. If you can be. Can you be deceived and know you're deceived? That means, does it not, that there's a higher kind of knowing other than being deceived? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Uh, if, in order to know that you're deceived, you have to realize that you're deceived, right? You have to realize it. Mm -hmm. right, that's to be something you're realizing. <laughs> See, what's the difference if we take this out? If you can be deceived, you wouldn't know it. Well, no, 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 no. Come on, try it. Let's see. If you can be deceived, then you either don't know it, Or you do. But if you do know it, you're no longer being deceived, are you? Right. Right. So he's going to say, let's take a look at what kinds of conditions are necessary for being deceived. And then when we spell them out, now, keep, now what kinds of Cognitive functions are presupposed for to be deceived. He says sense data. Right? Sense experience. You can be deceived all the time. Right? There's people walk away from you, the smaller they get until they finally disappear. <laughs> right? It's obvious if you rest upon just perception, right? That you'll be deceived all the time. He said, is that possible with this kind of experience? Ah. If so, then it's possible to be deceived. So he's got this one word in here that he s sneaked in. Is it possible anyone can think that true intellect, possessing true being, so this, this dude, what has he got? He's got intellect, pure intellect, functioning, and he's experiencing true being. Now under that condition, can he be deceived? Oh, okay. Among the class of things that you can be deceived about, one, right, you want to see, is being one of them? No. Oh, second. Among the class of things called pure intellect, when pure intellect is functioning, can you be deceived? Now he's got the two together. When pure intellect is functioning such that you are in this state, can you be deceived? Three. He says, well, you know what? After we talk about what conditions can you be deceived, then he's going to go back and talk about this. Now that's a, another way of answering the question. 
But the first one has to be this. Under what conditions can you be deceived? Um, look, the way he puts it um, on 160. Is there a difference between the kinds of uh, the, the kinds of knowledge, essential knowledge of intellect, and that which you gain or distinguish by investigation? Are they different? Oh, well, if they're different, then we want to know with this idea of being deceived. Can you be deceived by investigation? Yeah, you can be deceived by investigation. Hey, certainty. Likewise, from whence the certainty is derived to intellect of its essential knowledge. Hey. In this, Can the, the, can the kinds of things that intellect apprehends So, to be deceived, does that mean that there must be something which is real and when you apprehend it, it's different? Is that essential? Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Um, This means, then, that it's possible for a difference to exist. Agree? Okay. In principle, there has to be a difference, right, between the two. <coughs> and the assumption being that if you get into this state that he's calling pure being, right, that you can be mistaken. Well, um, then that means this pure being is this, and you can be mistaken about it having experienced it. That's essentially the problem, isn't it? And that means then, in the experience, you can you can in some way walk away from it, not with the real, but with the false. And he said, okay, 
Well, just just ask one question. Uh, is that possible? Is this possible in this experience? Okay, what is the essential thing? Is it not that you apprehend something different than the object? then you didn't experience the object. Apart then you didn't experience the object. Okay, watch the word apprehend. If you didn't experience the object, uh, <coughs> then you must have used then apprehend them, see, then whatever it is you're using to apprehend it is fallible. Now, all right, can this be true of intellect? Why would you say no? Because he's going to say, see this word apprehend? That is the use of intellect. And he's going to say, I got news for you. There ain't any difference between intellect and the experience of being. This isn't the intelligible. So he's saying, the intellect intellects the intelligible. Or is intellecting. Right? Then there isn't any difference between what you're using to apprehend it and the object of apprehension. Oh, yes or no? Stay with it. You can make distinctions. Pardon? You can make distinctions. You can make distinctions. Between? Between what I just wrote? No, you can't. See? If, if the, if the intellect, if it's functioning at all, is intellecting. If it's functioning at all, it apprehends the intelligible. Therefore, you're not going to apprehend differences. That's, a, that's basically it, the argument. Well, when, Isn't it the case that it's apprehending itself, I mean, that it's a recursive activity, and, and that's its, that is the, at the point at which it is experiencing real being, mm -hmm. and thereby in that experience there isn't the distinction? No. That's one way of putting it. But go right, ahead. it's not the way No, 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 it, no, no, it's, 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 it it's, it's, but look here, try it again. To be deceived in this picture means then that you're using something that can, see, you can apprehend something different from the object. There isn't any difference in the object that you are apprehending, therefore you can't be deceived. Can the, excuse me, can, can the intellect uh, function without intelligibles? No. Can. So there's, there's no 
Okay. So let's let's, put, the, let's put the riddle in another way, okay? Why do people use this language? Hi. Why do people use this language? Because this dude experiencing this, right? This is all he experienced. This is the experience. And he's going to have to say, uh, I encountered it. You'd say, with your eyes? No, 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 not visible. Oh, you heard it? No. Well, how is it possible to experience it? I mean, if you didn't use the senses. You say, well, there's something in me that's so odd. Now, I don't mean seeing. Oh, oh, oh thank you. Okay, I dig. No, I don't want to use the word seeing. But, so, we make up the term intellect. And we call it the eye of the soul. Right? Or that which you use to apprehend being. But, see, the trouble with that is... Uh, this is there in this experience there are no differences hey no difference same pure right no difference that's why I use the word same a lot same if so no differences but wait a minute it's, it has a vitality to it Right? It's, it's, it's not... See, when I look at something, right? It, 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 see, see it, it's not doing anything. I mean, it's, it's the surface of everything. That's all I see is surfaces of things. Even if I say it's alive, I'm inferring something, but I just see the surface. Right? When you look at one another, you're just looking at dead skin, aren't you? The surface of everything? Yeah. The re reflection of light. Yeah. Yeah, all you're looking at is colors. Mm -hmm. So we infer a lot. Here, you're not inferring anything. No it is luminosity. <laughs> well, what's seeing it? I don't know, luminosity. Oh. Uh, stays the same. You sure? No difference? No difference. Uh-oh, then you can't break it up. Then you can't break it up into three parts. It has to be intelligible only. Now, it may be worthwhile to make these distinctions for some reason in reasoning. The point, though, is in, in the experience itself, is it there? Because if there aren't any differences, where's the deception? There has to be, see, there has to apprehend. See? How can you apprehend something different from the object if there is no difference <coughs> between that which is apprehending it and the object? If there's no difference between that which is apprehending and the object, then you can't be deceived. All right? That is true. No, let me make sure it's right. <coughs> there, got confirmation. So when do... Or when do the distinctions of beauty and justice, the, 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 the distinctions that can be made... Well, the game is... Say, the game of philosophy is this. Say. People all over the world, all of different times, people bump, bump into this in a variety of ways. The question, though, is for people who want to reflect on this is, what terms can you infer from this experience? That is the most, uh, uh, um, that I don't want to use the wrong metaphor, but 
Uh, what terms can you, can you infer from this experience that comes most closely to the experience? Wow, man, that was beautiful. Oh, beauty. Oh. Oh. Uh, hey, you know what? I've seen a lot of things that I would call real. Nothing like this. And in comparison, everything else is shadows. Oh, then this is uh, most real. Oh, the, uh, there's no boundary. There's no boundary to it, you know? I mean, it doesn't end three feet away. Oh, unlimited. Oh, well, I mean, it is something. I mean, it, 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 clearly it's something. Oh, limited in that respect, <coughs> being something. So. Hey. Most real, hey, no, it, watch this. See, it truly is. Oh, it truly is, then you found truth. Oh, oh see, it truly is, then I must found truth. Oh, see, what am I doing? I'm building up a set of terms, I'm building up a set of terms from this kind of experience. And now, what do I got to do? I got to see how these terms interrelate for what? For only one purpose. Will these kinds of terms and others of similar nature, will they help you understand the experience? Understand the experience in these terms? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, baloney. Oh, no. No, 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 Is it possible by becoming acquainted with this, you are learning a vocabulary Uh, for understanding this class of experience. One more, and here's the kicker. It may prepare the mind for such an experience. Mm. And if so, there's only one question you have, so what? Will it enhance the experience to have this background? That's all. I mean, is it worth it? You've got a lot of work, right? <laughs> mm. Got to read, got to talk. That's the issue, you see. Is it worthwhile for someone to go through this kind of literature? And we have the problem of the twins. In every way, they're exactly the same. Only one of them has done this and the other hasn't. And that night, they both have the same kind of experience for the first time. Would it make any difference? That's all. Would it make any difference? Right? Why? If you think it would. For one thing, you might not pull away from it out of the shock of the grand, the greatness of it. That's very important. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you mean it may allow you to endure it, continue it, participate in it more fully? Right. Well, that makes a heck of a difference. So that that's something we haven't really mentioned yet, is that this is something that is so powerful you have to be able to endure it. Yeah, well, it's not for the weak and helpless. Yeah. 
<clears throat> Was it worth it for you? Unless you're like Huxley. <laughs> what about Huxley? Huxley on his deathbed dropped acid. <laughs> Remember that one, Barbara? You were there, weren't you? Uh, yes. <laughs> no. Yeah. Enjoying and toasting. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. She gave him one of their cell telephones so that wherever he went, he could play it back. You know. So look here. See <coughs> now, staying with us. Now you might be deceived. You might be deceived here. Um. Maybe there's a certain way to arrange these. Maybe it's not. But then that would be your understanding of it. It wouldn't be the experience of it. Um, and now he's going to go for the biggest problem of them all. And that is... Uh, What's the source of it? Well, because if you buy the notion that whatever is anything at all, if it is, it has to have a cause. Well, that is it must have a cause. <clears throat> Now what are you going to do? That's where we left the book. The next paragraph takes that up. That's the connection, isn't it? That's where he's going. So this guy is quite remarkable because he takes up what are the conditions for being deceived and can you finally apply that to the intellect? So what are you going to do first? Talk about deception. Talk about the difference between that which apprehends and the object. Oh, if there's a difference, then it can't be the intellect. If it can't be the intellect, then you can't be deceived, at least in that respect. Hmm. Now, this is where he pulls in, therefore, this is the ideal, the one or the good. Going to say now this this is uh, this is one thing, so that's another use of the word one. This is right one thing, not just the one. It's okay. That's going to be the that's going to be the task. See, at 161, he puts it very nicely. Hence, it is not proper either to investigate intelligible separate from intellect. You don't want to do that. Not separate. Or to confess that the figures of things only are contained in intellect. Or to, or to deprive it of truth. Well, you can't, can't deprive it of truth. But if this is an experience of what truly is, and therefore you have the right to assume, therefore, from that if it truly is, and that's truth, well, you, you can't separate the two now. Therefore, that's a, necessarily the way idea of truth must follow from the nature of reality.
but it's necessary to attribute all things to true intellect if it's requisite to uh, induce knowledge and truth to preserve beings themselves. And the knowledge by which the essence of everything is known. See the word essence. Come on, that's a come on, don't lose that. Okay? It's a, we, we don't use that word too often in English, right? Uh, whatever it is that can reflect upon itself. Anything that can respond to itself, that's essence. Like the guy that did that study on plant plants. He said, you know what? There's some evidence that plants feel. If so, then they can reflect on their condition. Now, this is going to ruin people who are vegetarian. <laughs> no way. Really? So don't spread the word. Just wine. shut up! Don't you know? Let them eat. You know, let them eat. Uh, you know, whatever they eat. What do they eat again? I forgot. <laughs> Hamburgers? No, no. <laughs> well, they, they did that study in Germany. You know, it's causing a lot of problems in dietary food. They found there was no ham in hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> did you know that? Is that shocking? Is that shocking? I'm telling you, it's terrible the way things are going. Talk about you Wall just Street. stepped into that deception. I <laughs> <laughs> didn't know you were being deceived. I cleared it up. <laughs> See, look, for, for intellect truly knows. Nor is anything concealed from its essential intelligence. Oh. See, hey, try it. For intellect indeed truly knows, nor is, is anything concealed from its essential intelligence. See, when you get this, when you get this, uh, this turns upon itself. This is a dynamic, dynamic, illuminating experience. It's, right, it's a lot. It's, it's, it's a, that's why one of the terms you need here is the uh, highest kind of profound life imaginable. Ah, then we put another one. So now we have intellect, life, and being. Right. Right, because this is essential knowledge. What's essential knowledge? The kind of knowledge that turns upon itself. Anything that has that property, then intellect can know it. Weird. And, you, and this is cheap. This is cheap. Um, <coughs> see the conclusion 162. This one nature intellect, therefore, is all beings. Capital B. That's this experience, see? That's this experience. That's what he's saying. This one nature, right? Intellect, therefore it's what? No difference. Therefore, intellect and beings, it's the same thing. And you know what? It's a great deity. Well, because you can personify it. If you personify it, then it's a deity. Rather, it's not any particular god. But it's deservedly eh, every any deity. So at one sixty three, that one great line there, I see. Um, see, this is the transition, this is where we're going. But let us now ascend to the one itself which is indeed truly one, not like other things, which at the same time that they are many are also one through participation of unity. For we must now receive one itself, hey, not by participation, 
right? We must likewise assert that the intelligible world is more than one other thing, right? Now he's going to go into this. This is where we're going, nature of the one. And by the way, that's really, if you get a glimpse of it, it's a frightening notion because you have to deal with the problem of nothing. Right. Difference between nothing and empty. Right. If the idea of the one can be up represented in Parmenides' first hypothesis, you can't say anything about it. Well, would that mean it's nothing? Well, I ain't got no thing in it, so it's nothing. No. <laughs> You know, that's the question David had, you know, it took the, for quite a while, right, David? What is it that sees and hears? I, I, that question grows. But, yeah, it's getting to, to be a better question all along. Did you took that one? No, I, I'm not there yet. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, having all this, mm -hmm. they, they really fight, yeah, you really go into a struggle. Does it get in the way of playing that game? Or can you, now that you've got it, can you set it aside and play the game even better? You know, uh, if you've got this kind of a model and then you go through that other process to, to go for the experience, uh, because it's, you know, it, it kind of is a shortcut, especially if you're not a very good reader. Um, uh, you can, it, it, it looks very much like what these Roshis are trying to do. Say, so can that which uh, sees be seen? And that would be seen. No. Oh. Can that which uh, hears be heard? Mm. Well, listen. <laughs> if you can hear it, then tell me what. Yeah. It's always going to end up being middle C, according to Yoni. <laughs> Whenever you think you know yourself, can you describe it? <laughs> if you can, what's looking at it? I mean, there's nothing there? <coughs> what? Nothing there? Oh, shit. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is where the idea of the one goes, see? Back and forth into this question of one, no parts, nothing, no, nothing. No. Jump in. Kind of a, you know, the famous Meister Eckhart quote about the eye with which we see God is, is the eye which God uses to see us. It, it, it's the eye that God does what? He uses you see. the us. Uh, it, it's sort of a mystical, and I think, probably parallel way of getting at what you're saying. Well, see, see, um, if you, okay, whatever, no, see, whatever language you use, you have to see whether it can match the experience that's open to you. 